Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, August 4th, 2020. COVID update, Optimal Health Associates. First, we're gonna go over statistics because they're reasonably bad. <laughs> so you might as well get them out of the way. The Oklahoma statistics are terrible. When I went to look at the New York Times today, we were the first listed state for the most rapid rise in cases. I don't know if that made total sense, but um, that's where we are. We had 841 cases reported today. We're at about 40,000 cases. I think the thing that's really, really scary, which is gonna get back to our central theme, that is what I want people to think about. I'd love doctors to think about it, but I really want people to think about it. We had 141 hospital admissions today. That is a huge number of sick people. Why are we getting all those admissions? Because we're not doing anything to prevent the admissions by treating people. We'll get to that. So number two, we had 15 more deaths. So our death rate, I think we've had 550 or 60 deaths now. Uh, we're definitely gonna hit our 600 in August. We may hit 700 if we're unlucky or even 750. Uh, there's more outbreaks throughout the community. Um, there's lots of testing stories with people who with obvious COVID with negative results. So figure the testing has to do a lot with how it's done. One primary care doctor I was talking to tonight and was going over it once again with the nurses at his office today. And he discovered that they were just swabbing the outer part of the nose because they looked at the, uh, not the instructions, but the label for the swab and it said anterior nasal swab. So they were only rubbing it in the front and they'd been doing that for several days. So that was disappointing, <laughs> he thought that his clinic's nurses, instead of when the doctors were doing them and the nurses doing them, but the nurses when they were doing the drive-by um, were doing it totally incorrectly for the last several days. And don't worry, I will never say what clinic that was. <laughs> it's never will happen. So that is just how it works and that's happening everywhere. So thus and so, there's a lot more cases um, occurring and basically there's no plan to address uh, prevention of progression of disease. Now, one of the things that happened, oh, so United States cases, 4.75 million, almost 160,000 deaths. Trump got interviewed today, kind of bumbled it. And again, dislike for Trump. I may dislike Trump for other things, but as a conservative, it is what it is. But him bumbling through that there's not an increase in cases or deaths or something is very confusing to me at this point. And it il illustrates the various failures of leadership that are occurring both federally with between the executive branch being in denial, the NIH, FDA, CDC doing nothing. This FDA, there was a report today how they okayed somewhere in the range of 180 million KN95 masks that are probably useless and because they didn't follow, they didn't insist on following the guidelines with the Chinese manufacturers because they waited too long. So again, the FDA screwed up all the mass things. It's like, literally, we might say they have the, the touch of S word, but I'm not gonna say that out loud, but everything they do, they mess up, just like medications and things like that. So lots of cases in the United States, lots of cases of the world, they're kind of going up everywhere. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to argue consistently we need to do pre-admission treatment. Now, there's differences of opinion on this. I mean, very smart doctors here differ from myself on this. On this, And that's totally okay. That's the problem with medicine. We read data. We interpret things differently. And if you look at some things, like if you look at remdes remdesivir, the antiviral that's been approved by the FDA for in-hospital use, the data is so incredibly underwhelming, it's frightening. But the one study that was ended before it was supposed to be, which showed a minor increase in terms of getting people out of the hospital sooner, talking to the doctors who take care of these people who use remdesivir, it works very well in the hospital. And, and it works very well across the United States and multiple other there's these groups that report what they're having the best luck with, and remdesivir is consistently in the top four. So even though that data isn't that good, it actually is working, and smart doctors believe that here and everywhere. And so I, I think, well, the data is not that good, but it's working. But that's what's crazy about hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is usually ranked first to second on the most effective treatment, and there's 
way more data. It's observational, but the observational data with hydroxychloroquine is 10 times better than a partially failed study that was ended early on remdesivir and everyone acts like it doesn't work. Well, my experience with hydroxychloroquine must be invalid because even though the 20 some patients I've treated and it's been remarkably effective and at a certain point with some of these people, I think they would have gone to the hospital since some of them were pretty sick um, as they were starting it. Um, is pretty positive and likewise physicians throughout the United States and the world and there's multiple studies showing its benefit. So again, it gets back to this central theme that doctors have different opinions, which is okay. But the bottom line is we're all aiming towards the same place. Let's cure patients, let's do our best. And when I'm talking about care, I'm talking about outpatient care. I'm not talking about inpatient care. If you get sick and you're in Oklahoma City and you go to a hospital, you couldn't be in a better city. I've said this a dozen or two dozen times, whether it's Integris, which is my personal favorite just because of the people I know, the infectious disease team, the critical care doctors, is fantastic. Mercy's fantastic, OU's fantastic, Norman's fantastic, Saints is fantastic, Midwest City's fantastic, the Central Oklahoma hospitals, the in-hospital care is absolutely fantastic. And what my focus is, is to prevent you from even having to go. And so that's where I'm coming from. Because once you go to the hospital, one, you can have significant end organ damage a huge percentage of the time, and you can die. And I don't want you to have either one of those. And then a significant portion of the people who don't get admitted to the hospital are gonna have end organ damage, whether heart, lung, kidneys, brain. So we don't want that to happen either. So that's why our focus is again, Let's think about prevention, what can we do? We can think about vitamins, vitamins, vitamins again, which no one in the mainstream media will talk about. The other thing is, again, I'm gonna say the hydroxychloroquine. The data is very positive by the smartest, some of the smartest people on the planet. So I think they're a good bet. The other thing is that Stephen Hahn, the FDA had said today, it is actually, since there's so much conflicting data, it is, a personal decision for each patient with their doctor. And so that's what doctors have to decide. Is that information they want to give, explaining the off-label use, the positives and negatives of using, <laughs> of using the Plaquenil and the negatives are teeny tiny. But you know, hey, that's a personal doctor decision. And so be supportive of the doctors who are willing to take that on and try to help people but again some people aren't going to want to do that or providers because golly the critical mass against you is pretty severe uh, but again it's all a personal decision between you and your provider it's not by the a pharmacy board it's not by the f the fda had said that so even though there isn't an emergency use authorization it is still completely reasonable to use so that's where you have to come down on all this stuff you know there's going to be different opinions um, on what to do, but if you do nothing and you have COVID and you're an older person, not a younger person, you are at risk for getting hospitalized. And if you're at risk for getting hospitalized, you're at risk for dying. Let's not go there. I've said that so many times, but again, it's worth repeating. Uh, other thoughts of the day is we do have a new epidemiologist appointed through the governor's office. Uh, unfortunately, our other epidemiologist for some reason decided not to move forward on July 31st and his contract ran out. So the governor, in his infinite wisdom, we've appointed the veterinarian, <laughs> veterinarian epidemiologist for the state, Oklahoma State University. Now, I'm going to be clear. The epidemiologist at Oklahoma State University, who's a veterinarian, is no doubt very, very smart. I had interacted with the a state veterinarian epidemiologist many years ago and he taught me a million things about tick disease so it's not um i mean i've learned a lot from the and it's, it was a different person a veterinarian epidemiologist for the state of oklahoma before but that was a, a casual conversations over several um meetings through an unlikely unlikely series of circumstances and I just have a hard time understanding with the crisis we're in in Oklahoma, how having a veterinarian who doesn't understand human disease, which is ultimately different, and the patterns and some of this, why that makes sense, but you know, I'm not the state 
government. I actually think there's some other people who could be appointed to that, but that's not my purview. So right now we're being led by an epidemiologist who doesn't treat humans for the single greatest infectious disease event in the last 50 years in the, in the world and the greatest infectious disease event um, besides AIDS in the United States. So that's a little concerning, especially when we're popping. Uh, so what else do I need to mention, Kim? Anything else? I think I answered most questions online. Um, we just have to take our vitamins, do our zinc, uh, wash our hands, wear our masks. Um, uh, now and then I get texts on how awful vaccines are. Uh, vaccines are not awful. My, I'm, I just have a particular, particular issue with rushing a vaccine that may or may not work for COVID. Um, Operation Warp Speed, uh, Warp Speed is I think Operation Massive Disaster because you don't rush medical stuff to run across an entire population. There's big ramifications for it. So that's really where I'm about ending tonight. Anything else? Uh, you had a couple of questions um, that might be worth on here. Um, people are asking about the zinc study that you've mentioned. How do you become part of it? How is that being done? Um, so the zinc study, I'll uh, put that out um, in the next few days. I'll put a link. You have to be a healthcare provider to be in the zinc study um, is what it's targeted for. Okay. And, then, and healthcare provider, any type of um, physician, PA, nurse, uh, anesthesia person um, is the requirement. So if you've already had COVID, is there any specific follow-up appointments you should make, like cardiologist or anything like that, just to be safe? I, I think there's, so are there any follow-up appointments? We think anyone who's pretty much over the age of 40 needs to touch base with their primary care doctor within three to four weeks after the infection, make sure they're doing okay. Because of the heart data, I think most people should get an echocardiogram and their physician needs to, or provider, nurse practitioner, PA, needs to think about how they're feeling. Are they fatigued? Are they wiped out? How do we knock out the inflammation naturally that may be residual? After any major viral infection, people can feel very exhausted. So how do we augment their recovery? And again, that's gonna be vitamin-based, looking at hormones, but I think Vitamin-based is very important, and thinking about heart disease events and making sure the cardiac system is working, if they're still having breathing problems, I think it would probably be worthwhile to get a chest x-ray or CT of the chest if they have more significant breathing problems or decreases in their oxygen saturation, looking for any long-term lung damage. But again, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but I think for people over 40, based on this, the JAMA study, um, if they're having any symptoms that could be consistent with cardiac symptoms, a 2D echocardiogram would be a good baseline test. And then finally, um, what about flu shots this year? Are they more important to get? I know. Oh, let's get into another subject that everyone will get mad at me about. So <laughs> flu shots. Well, the whole thing with COVID has made me re-examine re flu shots. So I think there's going to be guidelines from the CDC for the flu shots. There are guidelines from the CDC. I'm not saying not to follow the guidelines from the CDC or your personal physician on flu shots. I would also point out though, that since the flu virus is an RNA virus and taking zinc daily is super protective against all RNA viruses and doing a zinc pulse is pretty protective, that might be an alternative to consider. But again, I'm not recommending in any way, shape or form against the CDC guidelines because I don't want to get excreted by everyone on the planet. I think the benefit of the flu vaccine, one data set I saw, which I will re-evaluate and double check on, and I will give more information on that in the next few weeks, was about a 9% um, active rate against the, uh, the flu virus per season. So if that data is, uh, if I keep on seeing similar numbers that it's a nine to 10% chance that it helps you, versus a 50 to 80% chance that it helps you, you'll just have to make the choice if a 9% chance is worth doing the shot or an 80% chance is doing the shot. It's a lot easier to say, hey, it's four out of five times it's gonna save you or help you. It makes sense to do it if it's nine. Mm, I don't know. I don't know, a lot of marketing there for a 9% benefit. So we need to just kind of evaluate that. So we'll, I'll make a recommendation on that. But again, everyone can disagree with me I'm totally fine with that. 
I'm just going to give you the data and tell you my personal opinion. You don't have to follow it. It's fine with me. You don't have to scream or yell if you disagree with it. I will give the data. And that's the one difference I'm going to point out to everything I do versus almost everyone you're going to listen to online or on Facebook or read a journal article. I'm going to tell you the journal article's name that you can read yourself, which is different than just saying something. And that's what I've tried to do with all the Plaquenil data, all the remdesivir data, all the data on everything. So let's just always remember saying it doesn't work is different than saying it doesn't work because of this data set versus saying it does work and the data that said it didn't work has these problems and this is why I don't agree with it. This data over here clearly shows it does work and this is why it's reasonable to believe in it and these are the experts who are smarter than many people who know it better than everyone who also agree with it. So that's what we always have to do is look at the actual data. But remember, all the doctors that are treating COVID patients, whether outpatient, which is a heck of a lot easier than treating critically ill inpatients, are all on the same page. They want you to get well. So respect them, be kind to them, be kind to those nurses who are putting their lives at risk, and understand that everyone wants you to get better and not get sick. The focus for me is not letting you get that sick. So that's where I'm coming from. So that's it. Good night.